I'm gonna press start. Oh. Welcome to Fort Knox, live in Barcelona. This is like Mobile World Congress after dark. Like it is, it is really after dark here. It's pretty. The lights are off. The lights are off. Like the the people, they're they're going <laughs> okay, for tapas. Uh, but we're here with you because first of all, first of all, who's we? Arjun Karpal from CNBC across the pond, over in London. Over in London. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah. Thanks for. Uh, it's it's always cool. We get to hang out. I get to see uh, get get his perspective on tech on this side, uh, give him tech on mine, and we're looking at all this crazy stuff at Mobile World Congress, but there's a lot of hype. I mean, uh, Samsung's always got their launch. Uh, there's a lot of 5G talk this time, though it's a little bit closer to real now than it has been in the past. Yeah, there's a lot more examples here. There's huge stands here with massive 5G signs, but a lot of the companies here are actually showing off some of the use cases of 5G technology, which I found quite interesting. Gaming's been a big theme here. Uh, and also a lot of people talking about what this means for the consumer and, and mobile devices, of course, as well. But let's start off talking about Samsung, because this all started with Samsung on Sunday night. They launched the Galaxy S9, which had been leaked all over the place. Yeah. I mean, it was really some details about the camera, some of the software that we didn't know. Um, were you impressed? I think it's a solid device. Look, it's not a radical redesign from the S8. We, it looks very, very similar. We know that. So this is really about Samsung saying, hey, we still have a, a lot of users who are on older devices. They may be using the S7, which is two years old. They may be using the S6, which is three years old. And we want to put this phone out into the market and say, hey, look, this is a device you guys can buy and bring them in to the latest of Samsung because the S8 was a radical redesign for the phones. And I think that's what Samsung has said with the S9 is it's a, it's a proven d design. We like it, consumers like it, and we can bring a, a new generation of users on. I've got the iPhone 10. It's fine. I mean, uh, you know, the home button and touch ID, I actually miss it, right? Because half the time I'm using, more than half the time, I'm using this while I'm working and I'd like to be able to unlock it with it sitting on a table. And those of you who don't have the iPhone 10, you might not know, you can't really do that anymore because it wants to see your face. And you have to sort of do this awkward lean over, right? For those who can see your face. And then sometimes you give yourself double chins. Uh, Face ID doesn't like double chins, so it's not going to unlock for double chin John because they know that John doesn't have a double chin. I don't, I don't know. It's it's kind of annoying. Yeah. So sometimes I miss certain of those features. I am willing though to give Touch ID up for the bigger screen in the smaller package. Yeah. I think that, but that's a big feature we've seen here. There's been a lot of these so-called bezel-less phones, right? These the screen taking up a lot of the front, and I think that's quite nice because look, we're consuming so much content now on our phone. I think 90% of my Netflix viewing is on. Uh, my mobile phone and so the big screen really? has become so crucial and I work so much I'm on, I'm on the train um, over in London in the, in the tube working away if I'm in a cab somewhere watching something on the program the screen has just become a real big selling point I think for a lot of these premium devices huge screens um, and, and if you look at Samsung's S9 Plus it's over 6 inches that's a big screen but they've managed to keep the size of the device manageable it's not like a giant tablet in your hand I think that's that's really big innovation that we've seen in smartphones over the past year or two. John Ford, Arjun Karpal, live in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress after dark here yeah. in the FIRA. In everyone's the convention going center. home. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> going home. But um, so uh, they, they weren't the only one. Samsung was not the only one to launch a phone here. Sony had the Xperia XZ2, which is a terrible name. Really bad name. How do you market that? It's like, should we just call it XYZ? No, yeah. no, that's and, and it's confusing because they have the XAZ and the XZ1, and they've got they've, it's a lot of X's and Z's, and quite frankly, that's kind of a bit of the problem with Sony, right? The, the, the appeal to the marketing appeal. Mm. They find it really difficult to, to get the marketing might of an Apple or a Samsung. So if you walk around Barcelona and see these huge Apple posters, massive Samsung signs, there's not a lot of the other brands. It's just so hard to compete, right? Arjun, why are these other players still making phones? No. Is what I want to know. Like, because we, we see the stats that say that Apple and Samsung are eating up all the profit in the industry. And granted, that's not exactly accurate because some people are losing money, mm -hmm. right? And some people are making a little bit of money, and then Apple and Samsung are making a whole lot of money. But I wonder, like, I know Sony, they make the image sensors that they sell to Apple and Samsung. They have, like, certain things that they want to play in these phones. But LG, uh, 50 different Chinese brands here. 
Why are they doing it? I, I get a sense as over in the US and in the UK, the Apple and Samsung are so dominant. They're, they're, they're massively dominant. And so those are the kind of markets that we're, we're most aware of. But if you look over the, to places like India, to, to China, of course, and some of uh, a lot of Southeast Asia, some of these Chinese brands are doing really good. If you look at Xiaomi, they've made huge strides in India. In fact, I think they were number one in India in the last quarter. And so some of these smartphone makers like um, Oppo and Vivo, these other Chinese brands, they've made big strides in markets that are perhaps less mature and mm -hmm. there's still a bit of growth left on them. And they're selling these sub $400 phones with, with amazing specs. Uh, I, Xiaomi launched a store here in Barcelona, a physical store, and I got to hands on with some of the devices there and they were impressive and they were under $500. Mm -hmm. And they had some of the specs that did match many of the high-end offerings that Apple and Samsung could provide. And I think that's why you've seen these companies still manage to, to scale so fast. And of course, in the smartphone market, if you get scale, you can make money. Right. And I think that's where they're seeing the success. Not necessarily in the US, not in the UK or some of the more mature markets. Let's talk about camera features. Uh, it, for some reason, everybody's got to have moving emojis now. It's like they decided, okay, we did thinner phones, uh, we did higher resolution screens, we've done all that stuff. Now we're going to compete on emojis. The right. emoji is the new battleground for smartphones. Which That's... maybe means there is no battleground for smartphones, which is maybe why the unit growth yeah. has gone like this. There is no more unit growth. But Samsung uh, mm. unleashed their response to the Animoji. Yeah. And instead of a fox, it's you. Yeah. Did you, did you make I, yourself I had one you? made. It, it was quite good. I had to play with it. I was doing some sort of facial movements, and, and the, the emoji was moving, so I was like, and the emoji was moving. It was it was quite impressive. Um, compared compared to Animoji. Compared to Animoji, I still thought Animoji was a bit slicker. Yeah, I mean, did you did you find that as well? Yeah, yeah, I did. It, it, it just had the edge, but then obviously that's preset emoji. So it's the trade-off. Do you want your own emoji, or do you want to be a fox? I don't know. <laughs> I want to be a fox. I think I I, I don't know. Um, literally, literally, I want to be a fox. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I I think uh, it's weird yeah. to see an animated version of myself yeah. that I am making talk. It's even weirder to make an, uh, an animated version of myself and then see somebody else get the phone mm. and start to make a talk. And it's like, no, wait a minute. That's, that's me you're messing yeah. with, even though it's not really. I also found, like, if you're going to send that to someone, you have to go through a long process. You have to, you have to take the picture, you got to make the emoji, and then do something, and then go into sharing it into another wrap. You, you kind of want all that integrated into the messaging services you use, whether that be iMessage or WhatsApp. That's really kind of the next step. If they could integrate some of that, I think it would be more appealing to users. Did, yeah. Did you find that as well when using it? No. Because I, cause I'm in the U.S. Yeah. And we don't really care as much about <laughs> WhatsApp and stuff like that. I, I yeah. just do. Plus, I'm old. You're a millennial. You're on top of these things. You still Jeez. have hair. You know, you got, you got your whole life ahead of you. Me? I'm just sticking to iMessage, man. I think maybe, Facebook message. Yeah. If I'm crazy, I'll get on Instagram <laughs> to see what the youngs are doing, and then I'll scream, get it, off my lawn. It feels and, to yeah. me as if, if you don't have your own emoji today, who are you? Like, <laughs> why are you relevant? That, that's in the a, sense I'm getting right In the emoji now. world, you don't exist. <laughs> yeah. But serious point, though. I think Apple's spoken a lot about augmented reality and AR, and it's such a buzzword, and I just feel like there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what exactly augmented reality is, how it works, is it a term that people use? Is it just this jargon thing? People understand VR a bit more, I feel like. And I think this whole emoji vibe buzz is really trying to show people this is what AR is in a way they understand. But that's the problem. Yeah. Samsung called it AR emoji. Yeah. There's nothing AR about the emoji. Yeah. It's like it's just making a fake version of you with this <laughs> digital background. Yeah. Like, there's no augmented, there's no reality involved no, yeah. in that. It's just like an emoji that looks like me. Yeah. Ah. I don't know. Ah. John Fort, Arjun Karpal. <laughs> From CNBC, both of us, but from opposite sides of the Atlantic, brought together in Barcelona, Spain, for Mobile World Congress. We've been talking about Samsung's Galaxy S9 and the competitors, the iPhone 10. Sony came out with a phone. But I want to shift gears here because our parent company, Comcast, while we were here, announced that they are making a bid for Sky. Mm. And in the U.S., people look up when you say Sky, because yeah. we're like, what, is that a thing that you have over there? What, yeah. is, Sky, what is Sky? So let, let me just give you a quick rundown. Sky is a huge pay TV operator in the UK. It's got around, and, and actually other parts of Europe, the likes of Germany and Italy too, it's got 23 million customers. 
It offers set-top boxes. It's got major sports rights, so it offers some big sports channels. It's got broadband, second largest broadband player in the UK. And it's got a, a small, very small mobile division too. So, you so it's a mini Comcast. It's a mini Comcast. Original content is a huge part of their offering too. So you can see a lot of the similarities between Comcast and Sky. Do people feel the same way about Sky in the UK as they feel about Comcast in the US? In what way? Well, emotionally. Their level of care for Sky. Do people love Sky? People, people like Sky because of sports. So no. But yeah. <laughs> they don't feel the same. I just, I just feel like they're, off, they're often after the best deal. So okay. people are, from, from my experience, people are very ready to switch. If BT, which is one of the competitors, Sky came along and said, hey, you can have this package. You have for, competitors in we the have UK? Competitors. For broadband? For broadband. You can choose, it's fast can, in both cases? Fast. You can choose to buy there's, fast there's broadband even, from Sky? There's or, even three competitors. What? Yeah. That's crazy yeah, that's talk. Right. Yeah. We don't have that yeah. crazy thing <laughs> called competition in broadband. It's a bit of I think <laughs> that that is probably why people love Sky in the UK, is because they know that they can switch to something else. That's people right. hated AT&T when the iPhone first came out. Yeah. And they hated it because they could only get it on AT&T. So every problem they had with their iPhone, they blamed on AT&T. Then when Verizon got it and had a glitchy network, people all of a sudden developed this love for AT&T. I mean, you could, you could, so, so you could call up Sky and say, hey, Virgin or BT are offering me this for this much. What can you do? And they say, hey, we'll chuck in some extra channels for this much. And mm. so there is, this, people are already, the, the consumer is very fickle when it comes to their, their broadband provider in the UK. They're like, to me, they all seem the same. Still getting okay coverage, not amazing. But, you know, this one's cheaper. And that, to me, that seems like the driving factor. There's no kind of brand loyalty to Sky. Do you guys worry about net neutrality over in the UK? It's not as big an issue at the moment, I think, as it is in the UK. But Why? People, it's, it's, the conversation's not happening. The, the regulators haven't said, we're going to roll back some of the net neutrality rules. You guys have net neutrality? We have. Yeah. Like, what, what's the rule? Like, can they, uh, is you it just a matter of you treat all yeah, content yeah, the same? That's right. You can't be throttling speeds. Of internet. So we, we have that. People, people like that. People respect that huge streaming services. A lot of the pay TV providers are, are doing their own streaming services now as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you, it's a conversation that can, is happening. Can, can, well, yeah. probably not, because you, you guys have really strict like marketing type rules yeah. over there. I was going to ask, Very, like, could Disney pay a carrier to say, when people stream yeah. my trailer, it's free for them? No, no. they can't do that. No. Um, so, so we have pretty strong rules around that. Very strict broadcast regulator is called Ofcom. As we were discussing with you just before, you know, even on our airwaves, we can't show too much product because of undue prominence. That's something that you just can't do. Or, or if you're doing it, there needs to be public interest, there needs to be news, and you have to, uh, you can only show it for a few seconds to make sure it's not advertising. And so we have very strict broadcast rules in the UK, um, which I guess if Comcast does eventually uh, win for Sky, they'll have to deal with as well. Now, did Brian Roberts claim, you showed me this story. Oh, yeah, that was Did he crazy. claim that basically a, a taxi driver pushed him over the edge to, he, to make this bid for Sky? So apparently the $31 billion deal was thanks to a, a taxi, the bid was for, for thanks to a taxi driver. He was in a, a London cab on his way to a shopping mall, one of the big shopping malls, and there's a Sky store there, and apparently the cab driver was telling him the difference between Sky and one of their competitors, Virgin. And Virgin offers very similar services, set-top box, broadband, mobile. And he, he was talking up how good Sky is versus Virgin. And that was one of the reasons, according to some of the media reports, that Brian Roberts put in the bid for Sky, which I think is, is crazy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know which is crazier, that or picturing Brian Roberts deciding he's going to go to the mall in London. Yeah. And he's, like, like he's just going to jump in a cab and go to the mall? Just, really? yeah. just, just like the rest of us. Yeah, just like the rest of us, yeah. yeah. That's nuts. Now, <laughs> at, at the backdrop for all of this mm. is Netflix, right? Because everybody's trying to compete with Netflix right. content-wise. Netflix announced that they're coming out with 700 original series and shows in 28. That's Netflix. a lot of content. Comcast produces a lot of content, mm. too. There's some, I mean, I don't know, cross-pollination, mm. maybe, when it comes to shows from the UK that have moved to the US. I don't know, there's shows from the US that have moved to the UK. Yeah, too. yeah, plenty of shows. We get, we get a lot of shows. So I think what Sky have said this year is they're going to spend around £7 billion, which is just over $9 billion, on content 
this year, in 2018. And that includes the sports rights it's going to try and acquire. That also includes some of the original content. It's really starting to ramp up its production of original content. So I think when it comes to distribution between uh, of their shows into the U.S., this could be a huge deal for Sky because they could get some of this original content over to the U.S. Comcast could get some of its key shows over to the U.K. as well. So there's definitely some, some cross-pollination that's able to ha happen there. And, of course, it might also mean Sky can compete more around sports rights because in the U.K. what we've seen is Amazon have jumped into the sports market and have begun to talk about putting in bids for Premier League soccer, which is the biggest soccer league in the world. It's absolutely huge in the UK. Um, massive, massive fan base. And people pay a lot of money for the sports channels just to watch um, and their favorite soccer games. And so, you know, with Comcast backing, that might give them a little bit more cash to be more competitive in what is a real bidding war around these Premier League rights. That was well. really big of you to say an American on Fort Knox. You said soccer. <laughs> so and I, I know did. you're a big football fan. I had to so stomach I, that. I know. No, I just, like, I, did, right there I didn't and... ask him to do that. He just decided, just... Yeah, you know, since he was here, well, not here exactly, because we're in because he was with me. Yeah. He was going to make sure I could understand what he was. Just, just, just for the viewers, in case there was a confusion about American football and, and regular football, where we use our feet yeah. quite a bit. Which makes sense. Football. You know. I, hey, I'm just, not trying to... No, no, I'm just... You guys, just you guys came up with the language, and we just kind of borrowed <laughs> it and did our own thing. John Fort and Arjun Karpal, both of CNBC, here in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress. And we're kind of breaking down some major themes from the show, including Samsung and the Galaxy S9, including, well, Comcast and Sky, which wasn't exactly announced here, but it's been sort of reverberating throughout the mm. halls, especially when there's nobody still here. Uh, hey, security is still here. They they're are. still, they're they're still keep watching us. us. There's keep like us a human going. shield yeah. in between here that's, uh, that's, that's keeping the bad guys from yeah, coming yeah. in, which is good. It's good, yeah. So we don't yeah. have to watch our backs. Yeah. Um, both of us also sat down with Rajiv Misra, who is from SoftBank. Uh, basically, he's got a billion dollars. He and his team have a, uh, no, a hundred billion dollars. Yeah. A hundred billion dollars <laughs> that they're investing, not just in startups, but in uh, interesting technologies that uh, they think are going to mm. change the world. Mm. Uh, you talked to him a bit about Uber? Yeah, so SoftBank, of course, was very well publicized are the major shareholder of Uber now. Um, and they took, a, they took a pretty large stake in the company. I sat down with Rajiv Misra and spoke to him about what's the gross prospects for this company. And he was saying, look, there's still only just 20% of Americans who, who use right heading. So the growth there in these even ma so-called mature markets is still there. But also the other businesses, Uber Eats, uh, they, could, they could jump into logistics, auto leasing. There's so many businesses that he saw were available for Uber. He also you know said... You don't even have to explain what he said. Let's roll the tape. <laughs> Let's talk about Uber very briefly. What are you telling to the management there, Dara Khosrow Shahi? What are you telling him to focus on now as the company? We're telling forward? him nothing. Uh, he is uh, doing an amazing job. We're very happy with Dara. We're happy with the Waymo settlement. We are extremely happy with him recruiting uh, his next bench of management. Uh, the progress he's making with regulators. Uh, and uh, we are, we 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 don't need to do anything with Dara. He's he's running a great operation for we, us. CNBC reported that um, yeah. Uber may sell part of its South East Asian business over to Grab. And you, you spoke to the Financial Times recently and talked about Uber focusing on its core markets um, more than some of the other markets. What did you mean by that? Um, and and what does that mean for the business going forward? Uber is a global company, yeah. present everywhere but China. Middle East, Latin America, U.S., Canada, Asia, uh, and they'll remain a global company. Where one Uber app you can use, get an Uber car anywhere. If there's some fine tuning in certain regions where they decide to cooperate, that'll happen over time. Uh, but I believe uh, the future of Uber is not just transportation, but also food delivery, also insurance, car leasing, all kinds of ancillary businesses globally. And, and that's what a platformer should do, uh, to, to, to have access to your consumers anywhere in the world. And, and, but there's so much growth left in these countries. I mean, if you look at even the US, 15 to 20 percent of the population has ever used a ride-sharing app, Uber, Lyft, all put together. So there's so much inherent growth in those 
economies, Europe, U.S., for ride sharing, that um, you know they don't have to, and and they are market dominant in Europe and U.S. and Latin America and Australia. Uh, they just have to kind of uh, stay on course. Just the final one about the company. Dara's uh, said that they want to take the company public by 2019. Is that something you're you're backing as well? Of course. Um, your impression. I mean, did you think he's a guy who doesn't really talk on TV much at all? He doesn't talk to the press much at all. Uh, first of all, you booked him. You, you let me have some time with him. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> what what was your? Yeah, yeah, we share. We share. Yeah. We share. So, uh, w what was your impression of his position toward Uber? Because there have been some headlines out there suggesting he was trying to push Dara Khosrowshahi to, to sort of focus on the developed markets mm. for Uber and not so much push into other markets because they also have stakes in Grab, which is big in Southeast Asia, yeah. in Ola, which is big in India, and maybe he didn't want Uber trying to eat other people's lunch? Yeah, I think I got the impression that he sees down the line that there could be a lot of them, them two, all the companies working together, these ride-hailing com companies in some way. But for now, I think he sees Uber just trying to consolidate their positions in some of their big markets. As he said on the tape, he said, well, look, there's still large growth to be found in many of these markets. So my sense right now is he's happy with the progress that Uber's done on the regulatory front. They've still got a lot of regulatory issues, particularly in Europe over here. Um, in fact, you can't get an Uber here in Barcelona. Um, so that's a bit difficult. Um, and you, also uh, on the uh, cleaning up the company front, there were obviously a lot of issues under the, the ex-CEO Travis Kalanick. So I think he feels with Dara in place now, the company's ready. It's, it's moving in the right di direction. And at the end, he said, look, we think they can still go public in 2019. So yeah. that's, what I, that's the kind of impression I got. There. Let's talk about that Uber and Barcelona issue. Instead of Uber, here they've got my taxi. Yeah. So it's taxi drivers regular taxis, but you can sort of summon them from an app, Uber-ish, but they don't have surge pricing from what I can tell. So there are some times where it's just like certain nights of Mobile World Congress or certain times on any given night of Mobile World mm. Congress, forget it. Yeah. You can't get a cab through the app. And it's not very good at telling you either. It'll still say a cab is two minutes yeah. away, but nobody's stopping for you. No, I mean, look, we've used a number of different apps across across uh, Europe, Halo, My Taxi, for example. and. Uber does have the best user experience. I must say, look, they give you all uh, a very nice layout. It's easy to hail um, taxis. So the competitors are, are quite weak, if I'm honest, they, across the rest of you. There's not a lot of competition, and that's why you've seen Uber get really, really um, big very, very quickly in places like the UK, where they are still active. They have a few issues in London where uh, they're currently appealing a ban, but they're still able to operate while that ban's going on. But it is a, it's a fundamentally a very good experience, and, and it's, the traditional companies just can't compete. You guys are tough with the rules in the UK. Very tough. Marketing, ride hailing. Yeah. The, the Uber's issue in the UK is there was a lot of kickback from the black cab drivers. Now, if you've ever, ever been to London, the iconic black cabs, traditional, traditional cab industry, they've been that, protesting. Yeah, that doesn't and, mean cab drivers who are black. No. <laughs> that means the drivers the, of their cabs, which are actually, in, instead of being yellow, they're the, black. They're black cabs. Right. Yeah, the, the, the color yeah. of the taxi itself is black. And they have been kicking back very hard against Uber over the, ever since they've entered the market. They're like, you can't do this, you're a taxi service, but you're not regulated by the same rules. Uber says, no, we're not a taxi service, we're just connecting the riders to the drivers, and so we're a tech platform. And that really is the big issue going on, not only in London, but across the EU. There's, in many cities, mm. uh, and Uber's arguing the same point, and they're fighting a lot of regulatory fires at the moment. A hundred billion dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. That's what the Vision Fund intends to invest. Again, Rajiv Mishra is who we were talking to. I'm John Fort. This is Arjun Karpal. We're both from CNBC. We're here in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress. We sat down with this investor who's just got gobs of money. He was talking about how basically every big deal that needs to be done, every big startup that needs money, they, they get a call, right? They hear about everything because they've got so much money to mm. invest. So I asked him, kind of, what's the framework that he's working with, the philosophy about investing? Here's what he said. 
I want to ask about some of the investments you've made in technology that has to do with infrastructure. We've talked to Katera on Squawk Alley and their interest in uh, making construction more efficient, which is so important in so many parts of the world. Um, how much are you targeting big ideas like that and how important do you think it is for there to be patient capital in those kinds of technology companies? So technology is going to have an impact in every industry whether it's WeWork, which is also an infrastructure company, providing office space, hopefully we live. Whether it's Katera for multifamily housing at 30% cheaper costs and perhaps 30% less time. Uh, whether it's Compass with real estate broking uh, or Auto One with used cars, selling used cars. Uh, our capital is patient. We, wherever there's an inefficiency in the industry and there is a company that we find that's a market leader and we can scale and compress the inefficiency and provide better value for the consumer, it, ha it will succeed by definition. Um, so a Katera will succeed and the demand exceeds supply of factory capacity they have today to build multifamily homes at 30% cheaper cost and at 40% less time. And we are big believers in Katera. This is year four for you, coming to Barcelona from Open World Congress. It also happens to be year four for me. Um, how has your Mobile World Congress experience changed over those four years, Arjun? One thing that hasn't changed I want to start off with is my feet hurt <laughs> so much. This place is giant and walking around it is difficult. Well, I think what has changed is the focus every single time. You know, we started uh, four years back, there was chat about 5G, that's continued, but now we've got real use cases. Smartphone designing capabilities four years ago versus now, the jump has been pretty big on the camera tech, on the, the, the machine learning and AI going into these devices as well. And I think what was interesting is you've seen hypes, cycles in between all of this. There was one year I remember where wearables were the only thing anyone wanted to talk about. Now I walk around, I can barely see wearables. There's one stand behind us that has some wearables on it, but there's not a big deal about it. Again, virtual reality, big, big spike in hype last year, I remember. Not as much this year, I noticed. That, those are some of the big bit changes and, and bits and, and spikes I've seen in, in, in the, actual, um, the actual show itself. You know what I remember? I remember that the first year that I was here, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO, co-founder of Facebook, uh, was giving a keynote. And everybody was freaked out about Facebook and the way that they were changing, the way people were accessing the internet, and, and uh, Facebook had just made this bid that ended up getting approved for WhatsApp. And so WhatsApp was also disrupting the way people were messaging, taking away a big piece of uh, phone carriers' revenues. So there was a lot of freaking out about that stuff happening, and a lot of fear was driving this industry. This year, the operators, the industry with 5G coming up, seems really excited, hopeful. It's like, we're not dead. And at the same time, Facebook, in a way, is back on its heels. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally right. Spot on, John. There's a lot of excitement about, I mean, you've got an industry here that has just been struggling over the past few years. They, they're not able to grow their revenues, the user, they, the growth's not there. And so 5G for them is like this holy grail. They can say, look, we can upgrade to 5G, we can give you super fast broadband, but we can also support the future of driverless cars, of smart cities, and we can charge people a premium for that. And that's where they see a lot of the growth returning, I think, here. Yeah, uh, it's been quite a shift. Um, it's always cool to come here and see you and hang out I a little bit. It. Cover some news. Some tech, eat some tapas. Some eat some tapas. That does happen. That's, that helps. Now, note, note, here it is about 8.30 at night, and yeah. we are still at work. So it's not all fun and games. It's not all fun and games. It's no. hard here. Really this hard. Is, this is like an early night. This is. There have been some late nights. Oh, We've yeah. just been writing articles. You guys have been reporting. It's been crazy, but it's been amazing. It's as usual. amazing. Thanks for joining me on Fort Knox Live. It's a pleasure. Thank you for Good having to have me. You, Arjun Karpal from CNBC, based in London. I'm John Fort, based in New York. This has been Fort Knox Live. Thanks for joining us.